Good night, and welcome to Change Life Deaf Church Bible Study. We're so happy that you've joined with us tonight, and we hope that your knowledge about God and His ways would increase every week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time together in your Word, the Bible. We pray that your Word would continue to change us, help us to understand your ways better. We pray that what we learned tonight, that we would remember, hold it in our mind, use it every day in everyday life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Tonight we're talking from 2 Corinthians. This is the last chapter, chapter 13. The topic is what? Final warnings and greetings from Paul and his team. It's a short chapter. It's only 13 verses. Let's see what Paul tells them because he, remember, he's upset with the church. He warned them many times about what was happening in the church. There was division. There was sex sins in the church. Paul was trying to encourage them to change their ways and come back to God's way. Let us see what Paul's last warnings were because he was planning to visit them. Verse 1. This will be my third time to visit you. And remember, for every complaint, there must be two or three people to say that they know it is true. That's a quote from the Old Testament law, the Levitical law. And what did Paul mean? Not one person could blame some other person about doing wrong. We needed two or three witnesses, persons who saw what happened, or or could say, yes, that happened, really. That's what Paul is saying when he would go there. He's going to question, find out what's happening, make sure what was happening was true, and not just some idea from some one person who didn't like the church or was upset about something in the church. Okay, so that's what Paul wanted to be sure that they were all true stories from what he had heard from Timothy and others. He wanted to know whether they were true or not. He's planning to visit them for the third time. Remember, the first time he visited them, he stayed for one and a half years teaching them. We're not sure when the second visit was. We're not very sure. Maybe Paul here is thinking in the two letters, he told them he was planning to visit, but he was prevented for some reason. Now Paul is really decided that he's going to visit the church and he wants to be sure that they understand that he doesn't want to go there to have a good time, to sit in fellowship. He wants to correct them, making sure that they will change their ways to find out what exactly is happening in the church. Verse 2. 
when I was with you the second time, I gave a warning to those who had sinned. I am not there now, but I am giving another warning to them and to anyone else who has sinned. When I come to you again, I will punish you. Paul is not pleased with the church. He's worried about them, wondering are they still following Jesus Christ, or have they gone to some other idea? As we read the letters from Paul, we see that the problem of going away from God, that was happening over and over in many churches. They quickly turned from God's way. Remember, just like today, many people had different ideas about what God wants, about God's Word, the Bible, how to worship God, different ideas, and everyone came up with their own idea. That's why we need to continue to tell you to study the Bible, find out what God, His Word, says. God's Word has a lot of warnings to us today, the same as Paul warned them a long ago. He warned them so that if they still sin and rebel or refuse to listen to God and to Paul, Paul himself, I will punish you, he says. He's going to discipline many people there who refuse to change or repent. The church today has the same responsibility. The pastor, the leaders in the church, are responsible for making sure the people know the right way and encourage them to live right. If we see a person sinning against God, we need to warn them, not rebuke them, but tell them that God is not pleased with your choices of wrong. Please, we're begging you, do right. That's what Paul was doing. He doesn't want to go to the church to rebuke them. He wants to go to encourage them to please, begging them to do right, obey God. That's the same as a preacher today. Church is not a place to rebuke people. The pastor doesn't want to rebuke them but he wants to help them understand living right, holy, before God. That's the message. Verse 3. You want proof that Christ is speaking through me? My proof is that he is not weak in dealing with you, but is showing his power among you. Paul is thinking the church has a lot of problems, there's divisions, groups fighting each other, some sin. God is going to punish that church. How? By disunity, division. Now, some groups are against even Paul himself. God is showing his power, his authority, Paul's authority, to show them, make sure that they are not proud standing up against Paul or against God. The proof of Paul's message is the power to change lives. God will change them. 
And you and me, it's the same way. God will change us. That's the power of God's Word. God loves you. He loves me, but He wants us to change, to repent. I hear a lot about God loves you just like you are. Not true. God loves you, okay, but He wants us to change, to repent, to change our lives, to live holy before Him. Verse 4. It is true that Christ was weak when He was killed on the cross, but He lives now by God's power. It is also true that we share His weakness but in dealing with you, we will be alive in Him by God's power. Just like Christ looked weak on the cross because He didn't answer the people who were blaming Him, He allowed Himself to be nailed to the cross, allowed Himself to be beaten, allowed Himself to be spit on. But he died and was buried, and he resurrected in power. And that power, that new life, he offers to us. Paul is saying, I'm using that new life, that power, that authority, over everything, including death, to correct you. I'm showing you God's power. I'm telling you to repent. On the cross, Jesus looked very weak. But now, the power of the resurrection, God's power shown in Christ's resurrection. God's power is shown in your and my life. How? By changing our hearts, changing our minds. No person can change another person's heart or their own heart. Maybe we can change our mind a little bit. We can read different ideas but our heart is hard. Only God can change our heart. And that power is in Christ Jesus' resurrection. God gives you and me, the Holy Spirit in us. Verse 5. Look closely at yourselves. Test yourselves to see if you are living in the faith. Don't you realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Of course, if you fail the test, He is not in you. It's a good idea for us, Paul is telling them, to make sure that they belong to Jesus. Make sure that Jesus is in their heart by the Holy Spirit to change them every day, making sure. Test yourselves. Ask yourself, do I really follow Jesus Christ? Do I really believe in Jesus? Do I really want to change? If not, then maybe I don't belong to Jesus. I'm separate from him. He's not living in me. We need to test ourselves today, making sure that we follow Jesus Christ, or we just go to church to look good and dress nice. Pretend, Christians, make sure that you're saved, changed, in heart and mind. 
That's the test that we all need. We must test ourselves to make sure that we are in the faith. And the question is, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God to change your life? Yes or no? I pray that your answer is yes. Jesus lives in me, changing me. I know for myself, yes. God has changed me every day, making me more and more like His Son, Jesus. Because He lives in me. If your life is changing, then God is living in you. If you want to do good more and more, living holy more and more, it's proof God is living in you. Paul is telling the church there, you need to question yourself, am I truly joined with Jesus or not? Which? Verse 6, but I hope you will see that we have not failed the test. Paul is saying what? Paul is a true Christian. He would check what? Yes. Can you check yes? You need to ask yourself that question. I need to ask myself that question. Do I want Him to make me different? Today, different, tomorrow, changing me every day. Verse 7. We pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Our concern here is not for people to see that we have passed the test in our work with you. Our main concern is that you do what is right, even if it looks as if we have failed the test. Paul is saying, even if we look like we're not Christians, we hope that you are true Christians. You really have Jesus in you, working in you. That's our proof of our message. Paul is saying, it doesn't matter if you think I'm not a Christian. That's fine. But you, are you a Christian? We need to be sure. Each person. We can't wonder. We can't say, I guess so. We need to be sure, decided. The most important thing for Paul and for us today is what? People living right before God. Making sure that you and I have our goal Holiness, righteousness, R-I-G-H-T-E-O-U-S-N-E-S-S, -S, righteousness. That means what? Living right before God. You and I can't get that ourselves. We have to be given that through Jesus Christ. Verse 8. We cannot do anything that is against the truth, but only what promotes the truth. Paul is saying, we can't lie about God. We can't lie about Jesus Christ, about what God wants. We can't lie about those things. We need to tell the truth, true things. Paul's life showed that he himself Try to preach the truth all the time. 
In his life, he did those things to encourage true things. You and I need to do everything to encourage the truth. We need to know what God wants, and that means what? Open the Bible and read it. It's simple. Open the Bible, read it. What God wants is there. That will tell us. That will encourage each other to do and to follow His Word, the Bible. Verse 9. We are happy to be weak if you are strong. And this is what we pray, that your lives will be made completely right again. Paul wants them to become right 100%. Not half right, half wrong. All wrong being removed from our hearts. All right, all righteousness being put in from God. That was His message. That was His goal for the church. Some people think that Paul was weak. He can't speak well. He doesn't look very good. So what? Paul said, fine, no problem. That's fine. Are you strong? That's what I want. I want you to become good believers. Strong. Continue to believe in Jesus no matter what. Paul prays that all, all of them in the church will be right with God again. that they would reject sin from the church, that they would desire God's way. Verse 10, I am writing this before I come to you so that when I am there, I will not have to use my authority to punish you. The Lord gave me that authority to make you stronger not to destroy you. Paul has authority over the churches. He didn't want to use that authority to rebuke, to punish the people. He wanted to encourage them to do right, to continue to believe, encourage them to remove sin from their lives. That's what Paul was hoping for. He didn't want to go there and rebuke them and punish them. He just wanted to encourage them to do right. Paul gives a warning for his next visit. It's his third visit. He wanted them to prepare and to understand what he was going to tell them making sure they understood he wasn't going there to have a good time of fellowship. He wanted to go there to straighten up the church, making sure they followed God's word. Verse 11. Now, brothers and sisters, be filled with joy. Try to make everything right and do what I have asked you to do. Agree with each other, and live in peace. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. Do you see? Paul's final word. He wants them to live together in unity. Don't divide up. Don't criticize each group. Don't argue about different ideas. Live together, agree together, live in peace with each other. That's the goal of the church, to live together. All believers 
being the same, all trying for the same goal, righteousness. Paul was encouraging the church to agree together. Today we need the same thing. We can't have a church, a strong church, if groups are fighting each other, arguing with each other. We can't. If everyone is criticizing the pastor, he's a terrible preacher, whatever, if there's sin in the church and everyone's fine with it, we won't have a strong church. We can't be following God unless we get rid of all the evil, the sin, and remove all the division so that we can have unity. Verse 12, Give each other the special greeting of God's people. All of God's holy people here send you their greetings. The special greeting was what? A long time ago, the men and the women would hug each other and kiss each other on the cheek. That was called a holy kiss. It wasn't making out. It was just a kiss on the cheek. We don't do that much in the church today. But maybe we should start to remind ourselves that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. As a family, we can kiss each other on the cheek to show how we love each other. All right? This was greetings from Paul to the people in Corinth. He said hello to them. Verse 13, I pray that you will enjoy the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. From Paul, this is a wonderful prayer for the church that they would enjoy all three of those. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And those three are a trinity. It's a picture of the trinity, and it's Paul's final prayer for the church that they would be united in Christ Jesus. All right, so, what can I remember from this chapter? Remember, we, we don't want to read the Bible, close it, and forget what we just read. No, we want to read the Bible and remember a few things. I'm going to suggest a few things that we need to remember from this chapter. One, the cross is God's patient waiting for you to repent and believe. And that means God is angry with sinners. He wants to punish them, but he's putting off, holding back the punishment. Why? Because of Jesus Christ accepting all the punishment for you and for my sins. God is now patiently waiting for you and for me to repent, to believe in Jesus, His work on the cross. He's waiting. He doesn't want to punish. And He will not have to punish if we believe. And soon Jesus will come to punish all who refuse to repent. We need to be aware that the time is short. There's a lot of trouble in the world. 
and there will be more and more trouble, more problems, more danger. We need to be ready and expect, looking forward to see Jesus come back to earth. And if we're joined with him, the punishment will not happen to us. The punishment will happen to those who refuse to repent, refuse to agree with Jesus, refuse to believe. I want to encourage you to believe in Jesus Christ, to repent from your sin, to change your heart, let God to change your heart. Don't put it off because the time is short. Number two, look in to your own heart. What is in your heart? Do you have Jesus in your heart? Are you a true follower of Jesus Christ? Or are you playing church, going to church to look good? We need to remember, this is serious business. We can fool other people. They'll look at us, say, what a wonderful person. You're so nice. You do good. You help. But only God can look into our hearts. That's what God wants to change, our heart. And only God can change a heart. So, do you believe in Jesus or not? You can't have all two. Yes and no. It's either yes or no. Remember the test. Do you really believe Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross and rose again? Yes or no. Or no. Number three, believe the best about people. Paul heard bad stories about the church there, but he wanted to believe that they were good people, that they really wanted to serve God, but they were deceived. We need the same. If a person confronts us, has a problem with us, let's remember, I'm going to believe about the best about people. The grace that God has given to me and the forgiveness, I'm going to give them the grace and forgiveness as well. Remember, the gospel will change a person. Not you and me. The gospel will change them. The gospel will change their mind and their heart. Not you and me. Only God can do that. Let's not argue with people. Let's not get upset with people. Let's remember and pray that God would change them to change me as well. Help them to understand. Help me to understand. Number four says, there is evidence for the Trinity in verse 13. I have a picture here. Can you see that? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, like a triangle. And then in the middle, it says God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are God. But on the circle around, the Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. One alone is not God, but the Trinity is. 
It's hard for us to understand, but the picture gives us a sort of idea. That's the idea in verse 13. The grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Those three are one. Equal to God. All right? Okay. I hope that you've enjoyed our study through 2 Corinthians. Because you've been there a long time, many weeks. If you've missed some of them, you can look back and see some of the videos, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time together. We pray that your Spirit would continue to teach us and help us to have fellowship with each other and fellowship with your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that your Spirit would unite us to one agreement that we all believe the same thing. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, God bless you. See you again next week. Thank you so much for watching us tonight. We hope that your heart was touched by God's word, and we hope that you learned something about the word tonight. Please give us a thumbs up. If you like this video, press the thumbs up and also the red subscribe button. It will help us to get the video out to all over the world so that many deaf will see the videos. Okay? God bless you and good night. And we'll see you again next week, same time, 7.30. Take care of yourself. Mm -hmm.